السلام عليكم ورحمه الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آه نرغب في البدايه آه ان نشكر الجميع آه على تواجدهم ونشكر جميع المقدمين اليوم معنا الدكتور حسام زواوي الدكتور سناء الشيخ الدكتور عبد الله معشي على وجودهم معنا بمثل هذا الوقت مثل الوقت الحرج نمر الان فتره الجائحه الكورونا كوفيد 19 ندعو الله سبحانه وتعالى ان يحفظ البلاد والعباد وان تزول ان شاء الله عما قريب طبعا بالنيابه عن الجمعيه معكم علي العثيم نائب رئيس الجمعيه السعوديه للكيمياء السريريه اشكر تواجدكم معنا ونيابه عن رئيسه الجمعيه الدكتوره ساميه سبكي وزملاء اعضاء مجلس الاداره والزملاء اعضاء الجمعيه المنتسبين ارحب بالجميع تواجدهم اليوم معنا ونبدا ان شاء الله الويبينار ان شاء الله باذن الله سبحانه وتعالى Good afternoon everybody. I would like to welcome everybody for their participation and I would like to welcome all the speakers and the presenter today, our extended guest. Today we are having a hot topic actually we are living right now is COVID-19 and our webinar holding the title, How Does the Laboratory Surfaces Function in COVID-19 Outbreak? And today we are starting our presentation with uh, Dr. Hussam Zawawi. Uh, I have the pleasure to present my colleague, Dr. Zawawi, obtained his PhD in clinical microbiology and infectious disease at University of Queensland, Australia in May 2016. And he is currently the current strategic consultant of public health strategy, the Pallidum Group uh, Health Practice, MENA region. And he is assistant professor at College of Medicine, King Saud bin Abdul Aziz for Health Sciences in Riyadh. He is an active researcher and well-known national and international speaker. And Dr. Zawawi will discuss with us today the biosecurity requirements that are associated with COVID-19 testing. We would like to welcome together Dr. Hussam and I will give the mic for him. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the Saudi uh, Commission for Health Specialists uh, for, for having me. Um, my topic today will be about uh, the biosecurity requirements for uh, COVID-19. Can you see the slides? It's not appearing yet, Dr. Hussam. Okay, give me a second, you can wait. Yes, appearing. Okay, excellent. Um, so this is the uh, disclosure. And, uh, and the presentation today will be divided to three different components. We'll be briefly um, summarizing or giving an overview about coronaviruses. And the second is we'll go through the core requirements for most of the clinical microbiology laboratories or laboratories that uh, are manipulating uh, SARS-CoV-2 or, uh, or the virus that's causing uh, COVID-19. And we will um, finalize the presentation by going through the different recommendation for minimal working conditions that are needed uh, for the manipulation in the laboratory with uh, the virus that is causing COVID-19. So just quickly, um, I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with uh, about uh, coronaviruses in general, and, and uh, just to give you a quick reminder, coronaviruses is a large family of single-stranded RNA virus. Um, it's the largest known RNA viruses, and it uh, can infect a wide variety of animals and human, and they can cause uh, respiratory, enteric, hepatic, as well as neurological diseases. And usually they are divided to four different genres, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronaviruses. And uh, in human, mostly coronaviruses cause uh, respiratory tract infection. And it's quite known that about 30% of the, of the um, cold and flu that we encounter as human um, annually is actually in, uh, due to coronaviruses. Um, and up until recently, we as human are only known to have four different coronaviruses that are associated with us. Uh, the first one is um, HCOV um, NL63, and the second is 22E, uh, 2290E, and um, uh, OC43, as well as HKU1. Those are the main four coronaviruses that we always knew 
uh, to be associated with respiratory infections in humans. Uh, up until 2003, uh, a fifth member joined this family, which is the SARS-CoV, uh, and known today as SARS-CoV-1. Um, and in 2012, uh, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or MERS, uh, appeared in 2012, and that joined the group of five to create a sixth um, a member to the family. And only in, uh, a few months back, when the uh, SARS-CoV-2, that causing coronavirus um, or infectious disease 2019, has actually occurred. And that's, which, so we as humans are only known to have seven coronaviruses that are associated with us. This figure will show you the different coronaviruses that can have, um, can infect different uh, animals. So for example, here we can see bats are quite uh, a common um, host to uh, associate with coronaviruses, but also there are coronaviruses that infect uh, giraffes, for example, uh, Asian leopard cats, um, uh, as well as uh, feline, and so on. So there are obviously a wide variety of hosts that would make the uh, for different coronaviruses. And as I mentioned, we as humans have only seven coronaviruses that are known to infect us so far. So with this overview, let's move to the next uh, step of the presentation, which is the biosecurity uh, requirements. And the main purpose of actually this presentation is just to, to give you the overview about the uh, biosafety guidance that is needed uh, for laboratories that are uh, handling or manipulating uh, the SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that is causing uh, COVID-19. And um, However, this recommendation is the minimal um, and was put together by the World Health Organization on the document on the right-hand side. And if you can um, scan the um, uh, QR code on the top, you can have access, direct access to the, um, uh, to the document. And this is the minimal requirement to make sure that this is, can be uh, universally applicable to laboratories worldwide. But it's also highlighted in that document that national guidance on laboratory biosafety should be followed in all circumstances, which means uh, the final call is actually made by the, uh, the local public health agency. Uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia, here we have the, uh, the Saudi CDC as well as the Ministry of Health, which will make the final call on the, on the requirements. But what I'm going to go through uh, is the minimal requirements that was put together to make sure that it's universally applicable throughout the world. So the first thing first um, is the core requirements. The core requirements here that the basic requirements that are needed to be to exist in all laboratories throughout the world, um, and particularly those are handling microbiological agents. So I will not go through this in details uh, because I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this anyways. Uh, the GMPP, which is good microbiological practices, are need to be maintained in any microbiology lab, which is basically no eating or drinking inside the laboratory to ensure proper labeling for all biological agents um, are, as well as um, reagents. Of course, you need to avoid any inhalation or ingestion for the biological agents to minimize any formulation of uh, aerosols or droplets. Um, and of course, we need to wear laboratory um, um, PPEs uh, when we're handling specimens. And of course, we need to discard any waste in, in, uh, appropriately. Uh, and when we are opening the uh, specimens, we uh, probably we need to consider opening them with uh, inside a biosafety cabinet, um, as well, or by using um, gauze that is soaked with the disinfectant. And of course, we need to maintain the, the hygiene of the um, surface by disinfecting uh, after every manipulation. But also, we need to make sure that the personnel we, uh, are working in the laboratory are well trained and competent to deal with um, with the biological agents and hazards. And uh, that's of course they need to be familiar about the laboratory layout, the code of practice, as well as the local guide, uh, guidelines and the safety manuals. Uh, and of course the risk assessment. They really need to go uh, to do the risk assessments th themselves and go through it uh, in details. 
um, they need also to be specifically trained on the job, uh, which means in the, in, in, in the microbiology uh, laboratory, for example, there are several departments and sections, and they need to be specifically trained for the section or the job that they will be conducting in that particular section. So, for example, in this context with the COVID-19, they need to be trained to handle COVID-19 uh, uh, samples. And of course, they need to be uh, competent uh, with the uh, um, and, and the work to work independently, um, as well as, of course, the uh, um, they need to be aware of the hazard that can exist in the laboratory. And the, the laboratory has to be um, a well-functioning laboratory, which means it has to have certain uh, basic requirements, such as uh, hand washing sinks. Um, uh, and the doors need to be well uh, appropriately labeled with bio, bio, biohazard uh, signs. Uh, the uh, floors and the walls need to be uh, painted with the appropriate uh, paints that are used for, for laboratories. The ventilations also need to be uh, competent for to, to, to provide safety, a safe working environment. Um, and of course, the availability of disinfectants as well as autoclave and waste management need to be there uh, to, 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 to make sure that the facility is well designed to act like a, as, as a laboratory. And for specimens, of course, all specimens need to have uh, appropriate labeling as well as sufficient information on them, as well as uh, on the request sheets they come with. Um, and particularly when we're dealing with uh, highly infectious agents such as uh, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, probably we need to consider working uh, inside biosafety cabinets. And it's a, it, this infection uh, or is, is also a, a, a good practice, particularly when we are, um, before we move to, to further in the manipulation steps such as PCR. So now what I went through is basic laboratory requirements that each and every laboratory would ne really need to, to, to have to function as a clinical microbiology laboratory or as a, as a research setting that is working on infectious agents. Um, but there, there are certain specific recommendations that the World Health Organization has put together for the minimal working condition associated with this specific manipulation with COVID-19, uh, with the virus that is co causing COVID-19. Uh, and first of all is the risk assessment. We really need to gather the information to evaluate the likelihood of consequences for potential exposure to the hazard at the workplace. Uh, and that is by going through the, um, the related type of equipment that we are going to use um, and the, perf uh, the, the uh, procedures that we are uh, going to undertake in associated with the biological agent that uh, we're working with. So it's very specific to this um, uh, infectious agent as well as to the equipments and the procedures and that's why one of the most important uh, steps in the risk assessment is actually to draw to divide it based on or to conduct it based on the steps so for example you need to, cons to consider writing a, a risk assessment for the sample collection part and then some of sample reception part and then the clinical testing PCR culture, and so on. So for each of those tests, uh, steps, you need to consider writing your own um, risk assessment accordingly. Why is that? Because then you can anticipate the risk associated with each procedure. So you can uh, identify the, um, the appropriate control measures to mitigate any associated risk. So let's go for, for example. Um, if you are working in, in sample processing, for example, um, or sample um, reception, then you need to consider exposure, uh, um, exposure to aerosols um, through, for example, eye splash um, or um, by going through or, or uh, spills or leakage. And all of those potential hazards can actually be considered. And then you will need to identify the appropriate methods to mitigate. So for example, in this context, then probably we need to open the samples inside the laboratory, uh, inside the biosafety hood, as well as use um, uh, gauze that is soaked with disinfectant or alcohol or isopropanol uh, to open uh, the specimens. 
so, so that we can make sure the uh, infectious agent is uh, in, in, uh, is, is ineffic ineffective uh, on the outside of the um, specimen. The World Health Organization has put together a very nice assessment tool, which can actually go through each of those steps in details, as well as go through the different uh, uh, um, steps and equipment that you might uh, utilize. And again, if you uh, scan the QR code, you can actually go th immediately through to the, to the document. It's the same document as before, uh, but it's actually in the appendix of that document, you can see the, uh, the full risk assessment template. And here is uh, a few screenshots for, for the uh, questions that are addressed in that risk assessment template to gather the information for the hazard identification and for the risk evaluation. And then for the uh, different procedures and laboratory activities that you will be undertaking and the likelihood for exposure and release and so on. So it will be able to help you to build your own uh, chain of thoughts uh, to, to put together a well-addressed um, procedure, risk assessment, for you to, to mitigate any potential uh, risks. The following, I will be talking mainly about the uh, rec other recommendations that are needed when we are um, manipulating samples associated with, um, the, for diagnostic purposes for COVID-19 samples. Not for, or for, so basically in routine clinical microbiology. The laboratory work need to be done. Uh, the, uh, the laboratory work need to be done um, inside the, uh, for example, in PCR or RNA extraction are actually done um, at biosafety level two laboratory because the biosafety level two laboratories will ensure there are certain biosafety cabinets, for example, uh, that need to be uh, need to, to exist, and we will go through this in details in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, also, need to consider that um, most of the work or all of the work that has expo that have direct exposure to the infectious agent is actually should be done inside the uh, biosafety cabinet. And the routine microbiology uh, laboratory would include, for example, not only the nasopharyngeal swabs that we routinely receive as the best sample for COVID-19 uh, patients, but also any, pa any specimen that are collected from patients suspected for having COVID-19, such as serum or blood or uh, stool or bronchioavirial lavage uh, fluid or uh, endotracheal aspirates, all of those samples need to be treated equally as having uh, potentially the uh, infectious agents in them. And they need to be handled in biosafety level two laboratory as well as inside the biosafety level uh, cabinet. And of course, it's very important for us to consider practicing, as I mentioned, good microbiology practice procedures throughout any of these uh, practices. Um, and even if we get, if we receive uh, requests for conducting culture, for example, uh, for sputum, for example, for patients that are suspected for having COVID-19, again, they need to be treated uh, as if uh, they are suspected for having um, COVID-19, and what means they need to be processed inside a laboratory, as well as the inside biosafety level two laboratory and biosafety cabinet. So biosafety level two laboratories, have specific requirements associated with the biosafety cabinet. There are mainly two different uh, safety ca biosafety cabinets. The uh, class two biosafety cabinet A, whether A1 or A2, and then we have class biosafety level two cabinet B1 and B2. And those um, cabinets are quite uh, different than each other. Mainly, uh, a1 and A2 are actually uh, to be utilized for any uh, biological agents, while B2 is actually mandatory for handling um, chemicals with fume. However, this can be varied. And the reason is, if you go through the different steps here, or different um, rows in this 
table, you will realize that by safety level two, A1 and A2 have actually have a little bit of difference in the phase uh, velocity, but what's so what's in common and it's distinguished in the um, biosafety level two, A1 and A2 biosafeties is that 70% of the air is actually recirculated within the uh, biosafety hood and 30% is exhausted. And that, the 30% the is exhausted inside the laboratory. However, it's actually through a HEPA filter, which means it, uh, it's particle free. It should have no virus particle whatsoever, as well as, of course, any other particles. But that as actually can cause um, an anxiety, so probably for uh, laboratory practitioners. And that's why by safety level 2B2 is the one that is um, usually utilized. However, it's quite difficult. The only difference between B1 and B2, let's go back to the previous slide, hope they can. Yes, the only difference between B1 and B2, uh, B, sorry, B, between A1 and A2 as well as B1 and B2 is actually B2 as, as well as B1 have direct duct that exhausted to the external environment. Um, however, the A1 and A2 are not ducted, although sometimes you can attach uh, what's called the canopy on top of it to suck the air. Uh, the, the exhausted air, but that's not, not the common practice. Um, because of the difficulty to, to attach the duct on the, um, of, of, the B2, sure. of the B2, um, it actually can create um, a difficulty. So I just want to go through the poll to make sure, uh, just to ask how many of you have uh, the A1 and A2 and how many of you would have B1 and B2, and if any have any class three by safety cabinets. Let's give it five more seconds. Okay, obviously B2, about 74 of the attendees or 6% have actually B2, which is quite um, a small percentage. And uh, the vast majority of, of those who have the class two are actually A2 or uh, as well as uh, A1. The, uh, of course, you need to have disinfectants. Sodium uh, hydrochloride or bleach is actually recommended for general surfaces about 0.1%, uh, and for disinfecting spills is actually 1%. 70% ethanol is, is uh, recommended as well. Uh, viral iso isolation is quite important to process in mainly it's a, it's, it's a negative pressure. Uh, we, uh, and that negative pressure is actually exhausted to the outside, the front, uh, uh, outside environment through a HEPA filter. Um, and the laboratory personnel who, was ha who are handling the um, sample for viral isolation purposes, here, for example, it can be RNA um, extraction in this context for SARS-CoV-2. They need to wear uh, p appropriate PPEs, including N95 masks, um, gowns, disposable gowns, of course, gloves, as well as uh, head cover, shoe, shoes cover, eye protection, and so on. So all of this um, equipment, despite the fact they really need to process the inside biosafety cabinet. Um, I don't think we have enough time to go through the uh, poll, but that's just gonna, I wanted to test um, if you would use any negative pressure. And lastly, that's probably not applicable to the majority of, of us who are attending uh, this uh, session. But if you would consider, for example, um, culturing the virus or testing, uh, or, um, or testing the, the virus on antiviral drugs, uh, that is usually a separate risk assessment need to be considered. And the uh, recommendation so far is actually to, to be conducted under biosafety level three. Um, and the same is equal with the uh, animal facility. If you have any animal work to do with the um, 
COVID-19 virus, then you need to consider to do it under biosafety level three. And lastly is actually the, uh, if you have, if you don't have this requirements in place, then you need con to consider transferring the sample to the regional or, or uh, national laboratory. And that's all, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hussam, uh, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I would like to remind uh, all the participants if they have we are going to move the questions at the end of our webinar and they can write on the chat area all the questions we are going to select inshallah at the end of our webinar if you if you if you can also specify the presenter you can write before the question is addressed to whom exactly or a general question our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sana Sheikh. Dr. Sana is a consultant molecular biologist with a PhD from University of Manchester in Diagnostic Molecular Biology. Currently, she is a head of virology and serology laboratory at Maternity and Children Hospital in Dammam. Uh, Dr. Sana, a member of Scientific Board of Laboratory Sciences at Saudi Commission for Health Specialities. She is also a member consultant committee of biology and molecular laboratories at the uh, Kingdom, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, worth working with the General Ministry of Health uh, Labs. She, is, uh, uh, she participated in multiple national and international conferences as a speaker with multiple publication in international journal. We would like to welcome together Dr. Sana. She will discuss laboratory diagnosis of COVID-19 from lab design to test results. I leave the mic for you, Dr. Salam. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I start, I would like to thank the organizing committee for uh, organizing this event. Uh, this is the this culture. In this talk, um, I will go first, um, I will speak about uh, the virus itself, and we talk about the biology of this virus, then we'll go through the statistic lab requirements and uh, uh, test available. Then we will elaborate into the molecular diagnostic test result validation and interpretation. The severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2, is a member of the nidovirus family, coronaviridia. Uh, this is an envelope virus with uh, spike proteins. These spike proteins give the virus the crown shape uh, appearance under electron microscope. The genome of the virus is non-segmented. It's positive, the single-stranded positive sense RNA virus. It's a quite big virus with a diameter of 120 nanometer and the genome size about 30 kilobase. This is this SARS coronavirus 2 considered the seventh identified human coronavirus belongs to the beta coronaviruses, and it is the third human coronavirus associated with very severe disease. As of April uh, 19 today, the number of cases all around the world is more than 2 million, and this virus reached all around the world, infecting more than 195 countries with a case fatality rate reaching to about 7%. However, in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the fatality rate is around 1%, with the number of cases around more than 9,000. So there is a rapid spread of this virus all around the world, as we see with the reproductive care, steady rise in the care, in the reproductive care, this mainly due to a high transmissibility of the virus, especially among asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic carriers. Also, the appearance of absence of any cross-protective immunity from related viral infections, either other coronaviruses or other vi viruses that cause respiratory infection. There is no cross-protective immunity to any other viral infection in humans, and that makes it so severe and um, and affect the spreading. Also, delayed public health response measures account for the rapid spread of this virus, such as uh, imposing 24 hours curfews in some countries, also banning the trouble, school closure. All these delays in these decisions account for the rapid spread of this virus. As before the wide scale trouble restriction in China, 97% of the community cases are from undiagnosed SARS coronavirus 2. 
And it's well known that the key factors for containment of the epidemic or pandemics are first, early identification of cases and early detection and reporting of the lab results, which uh, cause early isolation and early treatments. This is from the Saudi uh, CDC. Uh, as we see here, the discontinuing isolation of the suspected cases or unsuspected or those coming from travel to uh, endemic areas or epidemic areas, usually the discontinuation of any isolation based mainly on a lab result. Without a definitive lab result, th those isolated cannot be either, cannot be discontinued. There, there should be a negative lab result, either a first or second or third, based on the rule of that country. There should be a negative, definitive lab result to allow discontinued isolation of all suspected or, is or isolated cases. So because the lab result is very important, so we here go back to the key factors, the most important key factor, or what's considered the central part of the puzzle that's so critical in controlling the, the epidemic is the detection and reporting of lab results. Because it affects in all in both in identification of the cases, might reform the case definition, and uh, also let us study more the epidemiology and allow for early isolation of all cases. So early or prompt detection and reporting of the virus will interrupt transmission, will decrease the number of susceptible persons by isolating the, the positive cases, and will reduce the basic re re reproductive number of cases by flattening, flattening the curve. It will early detection, it will allow as much as, as possible flattening the curve of all cases all around the world. And because the lab results and the testing many people is very important, we can see also a rise in the in testing people all around the world in many countries. Here I chose some of the countries. We can see the big rise in the people tested in USA. It's reached to more than 3.3 million. Also in Europe, also there is um, a steady increase in testing uh, lab and uh, testing sorry population. However, in Saudi Arabia, up until today, the Saudi Press Agency uh, mentioned that more up until today, more than 180,000 people has been tested for COVID-19. And this is a huge number of uh, tests or, or of lab results accounts uh, about, if we measure it, around 1,000 lab tests per day per lab. Imagine that in these limited labs in Saudi Arabia, each lab almost do 1,000 samples per day. So this will overwhelm all the labs in Saudi Arabia and all around the world because of the uh, limited availability of manpower, reagents, equipment, analyzers that have to work about 24-7 without stop. So to decrease the burden, in these labs in Saudi Arabia, the Ministry of Health allowed and opened the door for other laboratories to test for COVID-19 as far as they met Saudi national lab requirements for sars coronavirus 2 testing. And this circular has been issued earlier before about less than 10 days. And the summary of this circular is that although the, uh, the Ministry of Health allowed the testing of COVID-19 in different labs in Saudi Arabia, but all these labs are not allowed to test unless they obtain the accreditation certificate from National Laboratory at the Center for Disease Prevention and Control in Saudi Arabia, WIPAYA. And this is the checklist in their website and the Saudi CDC, the checklist, the minimum checklist to have uh, to be accredited for COVID-19 testing. The most important uh, of these checklists that uh, usually related to the structure is availability of negative pressure room with adequate ventilation and the availability of positive pressure room also with adequate ventilation, along with a certified class two by safety cabinet. 
The other important thing is also the availability of at least one consultant microbiologist with an experience in molecular biology in order to have a proper and accurate lab results uh, and interpretation. So the laboratory diagnosis is the lab has a very big role in viral uh, and virus containment or in epidemic containment. However, this rule is dependent on many factors such as the type of testing, the platforms, the kits available, targets being tested, type and time of sample collection, so it's effect. The resources required and available of, uh, for testing, such as consumables, swabs, viral trans transport media, and time to obtain the results. Time to obtain the results has too many factors that affect time and results. It's either the type of the uh, platform used or the, uh, the availability of well um, microbiologists or the interpretation, the staff uh, getting the result. Uh, it's effect, I mean, it's, it has two effects, either the type of the testing available and the one who validate the results. We have uh, two types of uh, tests, laboratory tests for COVID-19, either non-specific tests or specific tests. The non-specific tests considered as ancillary tests that help in the diagnosis, such as checking the vital signs, radiographic tests, chest image, CT scan, biomarkers associated with the inflammatory with COVID-19 patients, uh, I mean biomarkers associated with inflammatory response. All these are non-specific tests and not used for definitive diagnosis. They don't exclude a co-infection or alternative diagnosis. However, the specific test can be either molecular test or serological test. The serological test, they take the antiviral antibodies, either IgG or IgM. And now work is going also to produce kits for the detection of the antigens. However, what's available now is antibodies, IgG and IgM. These can be detected by a method called ELISA, either lab-based method or point of care. Point of care, such as immunochromatography, they can differentiate between recent and past infection. The molecular tests detect the presence of viral genetic materials, the nucleic acid, and it's based in the reverse transcriptase PCR methodology because it's an RNA virus with Different platforms, uh, flat, platforms are different platforms now available, and the positive results usually confirm current infection. These graphs show us the detection time of the RNA. This is the genetic material of the virus, and the antibodies. The first appear, first appears the IgM, then the IgG. As we see, the window period between the detection of the genetic material to the detection of the IgM about seven days. Um, so it's a quite, uh, one, it's quite big, one week. That makes the molecular test is the best test as serological tests for, might not help. Uh, it's mainly used in epidemiological studies, ongoing surveillance and therapy approach. While the molecular test is the best test for early prompted diagnosis of all suspected cases. Uh, now we will talk about the samples required for uh, PCR testing or molecular testing. The samples can be upper respiratory tract sample, nasopharyngeal swab, and oropharyngeal swabs. The combine both nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swab in the same VTM2 viral transport media to increase the probability of getting the virus and having a positive result by increasing the viral load as much as you can, and uh, make sure that you are not using a cotton uh, swab or wooden shaft, as this might inhibit the reaction and give false negative results. It's better to use a Dacron swab with a flexible plastic shaft uh, and put them in a sterile VTM, viral transport media. If the patient is intubated or can bring some sputum, that will be also a great sample. For intubated patients, you can correct bronchial alveolar lavage, uh, tracheal aspirate, or, or sputum if the patient can give sputum. However, these samples can be put in a sterile uh, plain tube. You don't have to put it in a BTM. Now we will go to the molecular testing, the target regions. For molecular testing, a lot of targets are available based on the kit. 
those, uh, this is the genetic map of the virus. And we can see here some of the targets, ORF 1A, operating frame 1A, 1B, and some are using 1AB, which uh, means the overlap fragments between uh, ORF1 and ORF1A uh, and 1B, then RNA dependent, RNA polymerase, RDRP, and there is also N with uh, many subunits, and some are using E envelope virus, N, this is neophyll capsid, and envelope virus and spike proteins. The, these are the different targets used um, in RT PCR, which is the molecular techniques. And based on the on the kit, uh, some of the uh, kits and some of the companies are using the three targets, like in Germany, they are using in their kit three targets, detecting three targets. Some are using two targets, such as E and S, spike protein and envelope. Some Chinese kits use uh, ORF1A with N, and some of them use ORF1AB with N target and now recently some of the Chinese get using only ORF1AB but with high sensitivity. And some of the US kids are using three subunits of the N uh, and some also of the kids using two subunits of RDRB. Okay so it's based on the kit and, and the company that are choosing one of these targets in the PCR. The principles of molecular testing. The principle of molecular testing, PCR based on the extraction of the nucleic acid of the virus, then reverse transcriptase, converting the virus into a DNA, then uh, amplifying it, the targets by PCR, checking, validating, and detecting the controls and the result interpretation. For nucleic acid extraction, and uh, BCR reverse transcript as real time BCR. There are different platforms. Some of these platforms, which are available in many of the labs, especially in Saudi Arabia, are semi automated lab. Uh, these semi automated platforms, these semi automated platforms, you have to do extraction separately, then transfer the samples, and you will have um, some hands on and preparing the master mix, preparing the constituents for agents and everything, then uh, transferring, transferring the uh, extracted nucleic acid to a PCR machine, to the detection or amplification machine. So there, is, there are some high throughput extraction and amplification machines that takes about 96 samples, and there are some um, that takes about eight samples, low throughput uh, machines. Usually now in COVID-19, they are using the high throughput machine that takes about 96 samples, but with semi-automated, it's uh, semi-automated require more, ma more manpower uh, because it has a lot of hands on in between, between um, the extraction and amplification. However, there are now a lot of fully automated platforms available. Uh, some of these can finish 96 samples with a minimal hands-on in about one hour, some of them uh, within two hours, and some of them are already available in our labs, but in a blood bank, and they can now be uh, used for testing COVID-19 and can uh, finish more than three, uh, more than three, more than I think 400 or 300 samples within a uh, few times. Let's more than 1,000 samples in one day. And there are some points of care that can be used in certain settings um, from uh, also big companies and very accurate, such as uh, this point of care upward, and this is the gene expert point of care available for COVID-19 testing. Two minutes. Okay, uh, now, okay. Um, control. So, for uh, we should have a minimum of three controls to validate the results. Internal controls that check for inhibitors in each single sample. Extraction control that check the extraction if it's okay or not. Positive and negative controls to validate the whole run of all samples. Each control to validate the result. Each control must give the expected result: negative, negative, or positive, positive. Then the we. We can decide the target is detected or not detected based on the sigmoid shape care and a reasonable CT value, crossing threshold value. Okay. So uh, most of the kids use two targets. So two targets had to be positive 
or more, I mean, two targets or more. So two targets have to be positive to compare the positivity of COVID-19 case. And because most of the case use two targets, so if both targets are not detected, this considered as uh, COVID-19 case negative. If two targets were detected, this confirmed the COVID-19 case. However, if only one target is detected, this is when we say it's inconclusive or indeterminate results. This inconclusive or indeterminate result might be due to low viral load and a proper sample collection or mutation in one of the target genes used. So to overcome this, it's better to ask for another sample and different time and use alternative targets by using different kits. However, there are now some kits that use only one target with high sensitivity and now it is available in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia labs. So um, that don't use two targets, so one definite answer, either positive or negative. Let's give one definite answer. To conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates the essential role of diagnostics and the control of communicable diseases, laboratory-based or point-of-care molecular assays for detecting SARS, coronavirus 2, and respiratory specimen are the current reference standards for COVID-19 diagnosis. However, serological immunoassays are already emerging for different purposes. And urgent clinical and public health needs now drive an unprecedented global efforts to increase testing capacity to curb the current pandemics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sana, for your outstanding presentation about one of the hottest actually area in COVID-19 outbreak, which is the testing part. And I can receive, I can see here from the chat that we have received uh, a lot of questions for the testing. Some of them they have been answered by your presentation. We will leave it at the end, inshallah. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Abdullah Mashi. Dr. Abdullah is a PhD in immunohematology from Aberdeen. University in United Kingdom, and he is blood transfusion consultant, head of Central Blood Bank, King Fahad Central Hospital, Ministry of Health, Jazan. Uh, Dr. Mashi is executive member of Saudi Society of Transfusion Medicine and member uh, of King Fahad Central Hospital Transfusion Committee and Research and Ethics Committees. He is a leader of elective care model in Jazan, model of care team, and he is certified Sibahi Servier and Lean Six Sigma Green Belt. He has also his well-known uh, presenter at the level of national and international conferences. We would like to welcome together Dr. Abdullah Mashi, and he will discuss one of the uh, important topics that we are facing uh, actually um, um, questions on daily basis regarding how we are managing a hospital, the blood supply and dem demand of COVID-19 and during COVID-19 pandemic, especially during this, pe this period where there is a limitation of access and limitation to visit donor centers. The mic is yours, Dr. Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ali, for your kind in, uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very glad to be with you in this webinar and inshallah, I hope we can uh, uh, give some up-to-date uh, uh, situation about uh, the way we should manage our blood supply in this uh, uh, unpresented actual situation with the pandemic COVID-19. Uh, <clears throat> I have no uh, uh, declaration or uh, nothing to, ex uh, to uh, uh, disclose. So the, uh, uh, we know that blood is actually uh, recognized as essential medicine and it is very critical uh, in medical care. Uh, many procedures could not be done without uh, availability of blood and blood products. And uh, because of that, uh, blood banks has uh, a major role in the healthcare, and uh, they should have uh, a plan and uh, uh, you know a system to ensure that blood is safe and adequate uh, for all uh, patients and at every time uh, it's needed. Uh, however, with the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, the uh, global blood uh, supply has been disrupted and uh, it's actually became very obvious that uh, this virus has uh, caused a major uh, risk for the uh, integrity of blood supply. And therefore it is critical uh, to have an effective plan and to manage all blood bank uh, related activities uh, starting from donor 
to processing, to testing, and to patient transfusion to make sure that the blood supply is continuous and it should meet all the clinical demands uh, for patients. The impact of the uh, COVID-19 on the integrative blood supply uh, could be uh, uh, seen at three uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, it's probably affecting the blood supply, uh, affecting also uh, maybe the blood safety and the demands of the blood uh, and its utilization in, in different uh, situations. Uh, you know, the, uh, the global blood supply uh, actually has been uh, severely affected by the uh, pandemic of this virus uh, and uh, the shortage of blood became very, uh, you know, obvious in all the, uh, you know, blood systems, whether it is a national blood services or it's a, a hospital-based blood banking system or it's mixed uh, systems, everybody is, is, is actually uh, uh, suffering from the blood shortage itself. However, the, uh, the real actual threat uh, to this uh, uh, blood, or the blood supply is uh, the unintended consequence of the social distancing, which is the core uh, preventive measure now uh, advocated by all the uh, health organizations that people should be uh, kept uh, away and, and stay in homes and to not to have a gathering and uh, to keep themselves away from any uh, risk of infection. And this directly uh, resulted in uh, donor reduction, uh, blood drive cancellations, uh, and also the, the situation uh, has been worsened by the, uh, the lockdown for some uh, areas or cities, and also the partial control of free uh, movement so donors could not uh, easily uh, be accessible to blood centers. Uh, in terms of blood safety, uh, it's, it's something that we need to consider always. Once we have a new and emerging virus, we have to, uh, as a blood bankers, we have to be very careful and, 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 and uh, take all measures that uh, will prevent the transmission of this virus through blood and blood products. However, uh, in, 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 in this virus, which is a respiratory uh, virus mainly, uh, alhamdulillah, it does not uh, uh, appear to be uh, transmitted by uh, the uh, blood transfusion. And this is uh, based on that uh, now we have you know, over than maybe uh, 1 million cases uh, reported uh, worldwide, but there is no single case of uh, transfusion transmitted uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, as, as a result of blood transfusion. Uh, the second thing also that from the, our experience with the previous uh, <clears throat> coronaviruses like SARS or MERS-CoV uh, here in Saudi Arabia, uh, there has been no uh, reported cases of transmission and uh, this is probably uh, has a lot of you know factors would affect that but it's uh, out of the scope of this presentation <clears throat> uh, the uh, however as, as this virus is new and we don't know much about it and every day we learn uh, maybe uh, a new thing about it so uh, it's better to be very uh, careful in terms of blood safety and uh, the uh, Minister of Health in Saudi Arabia based on the international guidelines has put uh, uh, you know uh, has put uh, a guidelines to mitigate the, the risk of uh, getting the uh, virus uh, from asymptomatic donors who comes to uh, blood do donation centers for donation with no uh, symptoms or sign of infection and uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, precautionary actions could be uh, looked at uh, at the level of blood donors, which I will uh, be covering in the next slide. And also it could be uh, at the level of blood components using uh, uh, technologies that are known to uh, uh, eliminate or reduce the pathogenic uh, contamination in blood components like the pathogen reduction technologies. Uh, also, it, it, can, it could be looked at the level of blood bank processing itself, uh, whether we need in future to, uh, you know, uh, introduce any testing for this virus, which is, in my opinion, will not be uh, needed in the, in, the, in, the, in the coming future. However, we, we need to be ready and, and looking to this and keep an eye on whether we need to uh, have this in, at any time in future. Uh, there are uh, measures to ensure the blood safety and as I said uh, these measures uh, uh, either rec uh, recommended by the international uh, uh, organization which is adopted here uh, alhamdulillah in our uh, situation in Saudi Arabia 
and uh, it could be uh, starting from the donor uh, himself. Uh, so we, 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 we educate the potential donors to, uh, to self-defer themselves if they are at risk of uh, getting the infection. Either uh, they are at the uh, risk factor uh, contact or uh, being uh, close contact with any uh, confirmed cases, or they are themselves they are not willing uh, or feeling well, either because they have probably the disease or any other, uh, you know, uh, sign or symptoms uh, related to the uh, COVID-19. Uh, the second thing we do in our blood banks is to uh, uh, defer donors uh, during the screening process of our donors. Uh, those donors who have uh, risk factors uh, should be deferred for 28 days, which is double the uh, uh, known uh, window period, which is the 14 days. Uh, this deferral uh, is based on the travel history, uh, which I think now uh, is not uh, an issue in Saudi Arabia uh, because uh, you know the, the travel is, is prohibited now, but this should be uh, uh, one of the points that we need to consider. And sometimes we, we need also to consider the contact history of the, of the, of the donor, whether uh, he uh, has left in close contact with uh, any confirmed case uh, or even suspected case of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, corona, uh, sorry, of the uh, COVID-19. Or the donor who has been uh, infected with uh, COVID-19 should be deferred uh, as well. Uh, it uh, should be deferred until uh, a PCR result is negative and uh, also for 28 days afterward. Uh, we have also measures related uh, post-donation uh, reporting systems. Donors who, uh, uh, you know, uh, develop the COVID-19 after uh, donated blood uh, has to be uh, reached uh, and, and, and all the blood components collected from that donor has to be guaranteed uh, for uh, 14 to 28 days. And also, uh, if the donor, uh, you know, uh, become positive for, uh, for uh, COVID-19 or uh, in close contact with uh, COVID-19, we ask the donor to call back the blood bank and report this uh, uh, within the uh, 20, uh, 14 uh, days. So what impact the COVID uh, have in the blood supply on the other side, actually, it's, it's a huge impact. Uh, the reduction in number of donors uh, is a major risk. And we, we have suffered, you know, those who are working in blood banks uh, uh, lift this experience. And, and we have very, uh, you know, a few, few uh, the beginning of the outbreak or the pandemic, we have really a, a severe shortage until uh, blood banks start to uh, put some, uh, uh, you know, measures to increase the blood collection and things maybe now, inshallah, will be better than before. So blood banks uh, are the one actually facing this uh, problem. Uh, it's actually putting a lot of pressure on people working in blood banks. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it has not been uh, an experience that we, 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 we tried before. So uh, we may come up with the new measures to ensure that our patients are safe and uh, the blood supply are adequate for them. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, there has been actually up to 50% reduction of the available blood donors. Uh, you know, it's different from hospital to hospital. Uh, this is basically, uh, you know, uh, caused by the cancellation of uh, bland blood uh, sessions or blood drives. Uh, also, it's due to closure of uh, universities, uh, mosques, parks, uh, super malls, where actually the blood uh, campaigns and blood drives usually take place and also due to the uh, other uh, areas that uh, you know we can uh, go and, and uh, find donors you know gathering like a, a beach or any uh, sport events or etc so losing this uh, uh, you know uh, opportunities uh, cause a, a lot of reduction in the blood uh, donors available to give blood also cancellation of elective surgeries uh, has also a role in the reduction of blood donors uh, being that uh, uh, more than you know about 50 percent of our donors coming from uh, family and family replacement donors and uh, cancellation of elective surgeries in hospital uh, that's mean uh, no more donors coming uh, to donate for their uh, elective uh, you know uh, surgeries or patients for elective surgeries also donors uh, you know, uh, are, are afraid of coming to the hospital to donate because they think it, they could be uh, at a, a risk of uh, being infected uh, with the virus. So uh, I don't think uh, 
uh, we, uh, you know, they, they are, it's easy for them to come without any uh, really a strong motivation uh, that the blood is needed. However, in the same <clears throat> time, we are lucky because uh, blood shortage, uh, you know, partially ba balanced by relatively uh, reduction in blood utilization. Since most hospitals change their uh, focus uh, to the patients who are infected with, uh, with COVID-19 and, and they stop uh, some of the uh, elective surgeries that has been uh, or have been planned, uh, the reduction uh, was estimated to be between 30 or uh, 20 to 30 percent, uh, which make things, you know, easier to, to maybe manage uh, so far. So how we can actually uh, manage the blood bank activities to ensure that uh, blood uh, is available uh, and at uh, an adequate uh, quantity for our patients. Uh, there are general considerations, which is uh, not only applicable to our situation now with COVID-19, but it's it's a planning approach for any uh, you know uh, uh, current or future uh, uh, you know uh, situations like that. Uh, there should be always an effective communication and teamwork uh, uh, between the other stakeholders and and uh, uh, you know level of administration in the in the in the healthcare system from the blood bank uh, laboratories. Uh, hospital administration, uh, also directorates of health, uh, minister of health. There should be always uh, a communication telling the everybody what's the situation and where we are going, and therefore we have to be ready uh, in advance for any uh, any any outbreak, any, any outcome uh, of such uh, an uh, an uh, pandemic. Uh, risk assessment. Uh, it's it's another important. Uh, part of the planning we have always to have a risk assessment for any uh, you know impact uh, on, on the blood supply uh, in such situation uh, monitoring the blood supply and demands always need to be uh, there and and we can use uh, uh, kpis uh, continuous uh, monitoring of kpis to see where we are going and where we we have to uh, you know escalate our plans uh, to the next level of uh, of, of, of you know like uh, response. Uh, developing a blood uh, contingency plan, this is an e essential uh, uh, re uh, you know, requirements in every blood bank, uh, but it's, it's become more uh, needed in such situation, especially in severe shortage of blood, we have to have a clear uh, a contingency plan and uh, uh, that can uh, minimize the effect of blood shortage. Effective management uh, of blood bank uh, resources, uh, staff, uh, equipment, uh, other materials. We have to be uh, sure that all the requirement uh, equipment and supply are, are available. And also staffing is very important uh, because uh, they are themselves at risk of uh, getting infected either in the in the in the public uh, you know uh, setting or uh, in donor center when they uh, may be exposed to uh, with the you know, uh, uh, you know, exposed with donor who, who may be infected uh, but asymptomatic, or also uh, uh, from the samples that is handled in, in the lab. Uh, we have to keep our uh, plans always uh, dynamic. Uh, we have to be flexible and uh, adopt our, uh, you know, our response uh, according to the up to date uh, situations and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, infection, uh, spreading, etc. So we have to be always uh, ready to respond or to uh, either, uh, you know, upregulate or downregulate our response uh, in terms of uh, this uh, pandemic. The strategies to ensure adequate blood, I know this is, this is not easy to do. However, we have to have a, a plan. I mean, we cannot go just blindly uh, trying this and that. We, we have to really to have a clear plan where we are going and what we can use uh, to make sure that blood uh, donors are coming uh, because this is the main reason for uh, blood shortage. So we need to increase and maximize the number of donors who can be uh, accessible. And these uh, need uh, in my opinion, uh, a clear and continuous message uh, about the need of blood uh, to save lives. Because uh, as, as, as a society, alhamdulillah, in Saudi Arabia, we are very, you know, uh, close to each other and we can uh, respond quickly and uh, either, alhamdulillah, because of our rel religion and our also families, we can easily understand the need of such patients for, for blood. So, uh, however, we need a clear and continuous message. The, the message should be there all the time that blood is needed uh, always and, and, and it does not, you know, stop or uh, uh, just temporarily. Uh, 
Uh, we need appropriate donor education and communication. Uh, donors sometimes they are uh, worried about being infected if they come to hospital or they think that uh, they may be uh, infected if they come to and donate or they may be uh, you know, thinking that yeah, there is enough blood in, in the blood bank so we don't need to go and donate. Uh, we need always to keep donor informed and uh, continuous communication with them. Uh, we can have a plan which is very effective to uh, uh, start with regular donors who is known to be easily uh, you know, recruited uh, again. And we can also have a targeted uh, donor uh, recruitment based on the blood groups, uh, for example, uh, group O. We can have uh, targeted populations uh, like hospital staffs, and we have used this in the first uh, few days of the pandemic, and it was very effective. We can also go to uh, uh, community, uh, uh, you know, clubs, and, and uh, we can also approach military institutions, uh, you know, which, uh, alhamdulillah, they are very helpful and they are working, so they are not affected by the closure of different uh, institutions. Uh, one, one approach we need to maybe consider, or we have also used, is to increase the accessibility of potential donors to blood collection sites, either by moving the donation site outside the, so the hospital, or we can extend the working hours to uh, a time that's suitable for uh, the donor to come and donate. Uh, one, one thing also we can do, revise the donor selection criteria. Uh, and this is need to be validated with the Ministry of Health and other regulatory uh, you know, uh, uh, agencies uh, because the AABB, for example, has uh, uh, published uh, a suggestion for or, or a guidelines for uh, uh, revising the donor selecting criteria like for, like for malaria or for uh, you know, other uh, risk factors. Uh, so for example, for malaria, you know, you know if, uh, if it isn't like uh, being away uh, or at a risk of getting malaria uh, reduction, uh, or the time of the uh, deferral reduced from one year to three months. Uh, it's very important to involve other uh, community societies, uh, non-governmental organizations and blood drive organization. And uh, we had a very nice experience with, with this. So with charities, you know, Jamiat al Ahliya, uh, they are very effective if, if they are actually being involved uh, uh, to, to organize a blood campaign in, 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 uh, in other, uh, you know, outside the hospitals, either in, 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 uh, it's in, in uh, with, with all, of course, with all the precautions that donors should be uh, kept safe as well as the staff. Uh, the consideration of double unit uh, donation, like red cell double unit donation, is another way to maximize the, the, the outcome from single donors. Uh, there are also, there are a few initiatives now uh, is, is being actually uh, in place, like home donation, which is a new uh, and, and uh, uh, something that uh, we, we, we start seeing and in, in our region also we started. However, we, I think it's need to be uh, effectively managed uh, and, and also the quality and safety of both the donor and blood component uh, collected need to be uh, kept uh, as a priority. Also, uh, another uh, maybe uh, approach to provide blood transport, uh, sorry, uh, donor transportation to the uh, donation campaign, uh, especially uh, with this uh, movement restriction. Uh, we know now there is uh, the routine application. You can you can get uh, uh, you know a pass uh, uh, permission to, to go and donate and come back uh, at certain time. <clears throat> the other part of the uh, uh, to make sure that the blood is, is enough is to control the, 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 the uh, or to uh, control the inventory that you have. You, you have to always to assess the blood uh, stock in, in our blood banks uh, using the uh, stock level and uh, putting a line that in this level we have to uh, accelerate our response. Uh, we need effective communication with the medical teams, uh, especially those who are, you know, uh, with our surgeons, with our anesthesia uh, personnel, uh, and to also our, uh, you know, medical team that uh, to, to start to minimizing the blood utilization in these patients. Uh, optimization, the use of available blood uh, and reducing unnecessary transfusion uh, using uh, the, the, the uh, measures of, for example, postponing elective surgeries, which has been uh, the first maybe respond to such uh, uh, shortage. Uh, also, uh, implementation of patient blood management guidelines, which is very important and uh, uh, from literature, it's, it's appeared to be one of the most effective uh, methods in such a scenario.
implementing a restrictive uh, transfusion triggers. So this is also again uh, very important to reduce the level, uh, you know, either the hemoglobin level or platelet count level that patient could be transfused. Uh, uh, at the same time, not compromising the patient's safety uh, and, and trying just to minimize the amount of blood that needs to be given to a certain patient. Uh, we have to have a plan for worst case scenario. Uh, in, 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 inshallah, we will not reach that, but we have to have a plan. Uh, Two minutes. Which, yeah. Uh, when we have a severe and persistent blood shortage, uh, we can have like a split unit uh, between patients. We could we could have a FFP as uh, as as a universal plasma for massively transfused uh, or bleeding patients. Blood stock exchange it's happening now. Uh, if you have uh, extra than what you need, you you can also arrange with uh, either at the national level or regional level to give it to other hospitals. So in summary. <clears throat> Uh, COVID-19 pandemic has put actually the blood uh, supply integrity at risk. Uh, we, we see now it's a huge impact in the blood and it's a lot of actually lessons will be learned from this. Uh, effective management of blood bank activities is critical to ensure safe and adequate blood supply that meets the clinical demands. Uh, blood donor reduction must be addressed uh, and uh, addressed not on the level of the blood bank only, but also at the administration of the, uh, you know, uh, the hospital as well as the directorate. So all the support and resources needed for for uh, correcting this uh, shortage need to be, uh, you know, there. The capacity of our blood banks uh, need to be assessed and maximized, uh, probably through the consideration of establishment of a national blood transfusion services in future uh, uh, and also uh, I advise myself and my colleagues in the field to uh, inshallah in future share our experience and feedback uh, how we could manage uh, our blood banks in this situation which could be actually a good example for uh, next uh, you know in future if something happened like that uh, thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for your informative presentation. And uh, actually, we have seen, we have a lot, a lot of questions exceeding 160 questions. And uh, as you know, that we cannot answer all these questions, but we are trying to select uh, some questions most, most likely related to the presentation and uh, our topics for today. And uh, since, uh, Dr. Abdullah, since you, you are the last presenter, we have also questions that uh, addressed to you, do, do you only depends on the donor symptoms and contact history, or is there is routine IgM and IgG testing? Uh, sorry, Dr. Ali, can you just repeat the question? Uh, uh, yes, uh, there, there is a, a question uh, okay. addressed to you, do you only depend on the donor symptoms or and contact history, or is there is routine IgM and IgG testing. Yes. Uh, no. So far, actually, we we haven't uh, we haven't started the uh, we haven't started the uh, any, any any testing. Uh, and and uh, when I when I said the the uh, risk of contact, it's actually uh, we are only now worried about asymptomatic donors who can come and donate uh, uh, in in the incubation period where there is no symptoms. But uh, maybe that's another, you know, uh, you know, another maybe occasion we can show exactly when the antibody uh, can be detected and, and uh, rel relative to the symptoms. But uh, so far we don't actually test uh, for, uh, for 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 any any uh, you know antibodies uh, either IgG or IgM. But Dr. Sana could maybe highlight this more if, if there is anything okay. you can add. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. And uh, Dr. Sana, we have a question actually also for you. Why do we need a negative pressure to handle COVID-19 if WHO says that it is transmitted by droplets? And Dr. Sana, are you online with us? Hello? Sorry, it was muted. Hey, hello? Uh, yeah, Dr. Sana, uh, I repeat the question or you hear the question? No, I heard the question. Okay. Okay. Uh, the WHO said it's a droplet. Uh, a droplet, it's a transfer, is transmitted by droplets. 
but it's put in its requirement that uh, there, uh, there is a requ it's required to have a negative airflow, either a biosafety cabinet or a room. So if you have a biosafety cabinet, that will be enough. However, uh, up until now, it's not proven that it's not air. It's proven that it's a droplet, but it's not an air. And the droplets can stay a long time in the air. Here in Saudi Arabia, the requirement for negative pressure room is only based on the Saudi um, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I think, I believe in putting a more stringent um, uh, rules to contain the virus because if a healthcare workers get infected, that will be um, a disaster. Because you know, the healthcare, now we depend on healthcare workers. Uh, so I believe in putting a negative pressure room, especially that while dealing with samples, with samples inside the lab, sometimes we require treatment and center and uh, vortex in the samples, which might uh, bring some aerosols. So um, I believe in the requirement of negative pressure room because WHO put the minimal requirements and it's okay to increase the precautions. It's actually the, you. Uh, that's right. That's that's actually the the requirements of the WHO is to have the virus isolation process, for example, uh, in this case RNA extraction, to be done in 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 a negative pressure um, environment. So, environment, yeah, so. which is by safety, but here in Saudi Arabia they want by safety and negative pressure room both. No, no, both is actually uh, this yeah, is both. The, the requirement of the WHO as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you, Dr. Hussam, uh, Dr. Sana. And we have actually repeated the question many times here related. Uh, Dr. Sana, mainly it could be uh, related to your presentation regarding the testing part also, related to the accuracy of the current testing and false positive and false negative. So here, the BCR is very sensitive usually. All BCRs are very sensitive, reaching the sensitivity is more than 95, sometimes reaching 100. The limit of detection, the accuracy of the test is all, most of the tests are available. Accuracy is 10 copies. So they can detect up to 10 copies of the viral genome. So they are quite high sensitive. However, the false negative results, we cannot see false positive. It's, it's, it's almost, we don't have false positive. It's rare. It's due to usually contamination, but for the test itself, the kit, it's, we don't have false positive. False negative, could, many factors can play a role in false negative, uh, such as collecting of the samples. Uh, many inhibitors can, um, can affect the samples. As simple as uh, the gloves, if the one who collects the samples use a gloves with a powder, the powder, trace amount of the powder from the gloves inside the sample might inhibit the PCR, inhibit the molecular test and give negative results. That's why the collection of the sample is a very crucial step. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Sana. And we have a question also directed to you, Dr. Sana, from the president okay. of Saudi society, Dr. Subki. Uh, she is asking which is better, one target or two target, I say in your opinion. Uh, okay. Uh, this, in my opinion, I think usually, and most of the kids are using two targets. Uh, just uh, there is, I don't believe in one as a screening and one as a confirmatory. Both of them can be a screening. Both of the targets can be as a confirmatory, because to have to confirm the results, you have to have at least two positive genes. So using this is, in, I mean, this is generally using two targets will allow you to take the virus even if if uh, mutation happened in one of the uh, genes. However, the, uh, the one kit used now with one target has been evaluated and even though its result, inconclusive result, gave a positive result with one target. So it seems uh, that it's using a high conservative region and it's very sensitive. But personally, I believe in two targets. Uh, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Sana. Dr. Hussam, uh, there is a question uh, re regarding uh, your topic that is it necessary to have a safety cabinet to deal with COVID sample even in collection of sample only to send it to Mecca so they are uh, just uh, yeah no uh, yeah usually uh, the uh, process of, of sample process is what need to be um, within by safety uh, uh, cabinet but collect, for sample collection or for um, writing on the, on the sample, for example, or to put it inside the biosafety bag, all of that um, is not necessary because the sample is not open. 
but I have another, I received also another important question, um, which quite yeah. similar, is re related to blood and serum. Yes, if the sample is from a patient suspected to have COVID-19, then um, the role of thumb is to process it inside the biosafety cabinet as well. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Good. And actually, uh, for the sake of the time, we can take this last question for Dr. Sana. What is uh, the sample stability, nasopharyngeal swab, when sent without BTA media? Uh, how can you send a swab without? If you send a swab without VTM, it means it will dry immediately. It, will, it means a dry swab, almost dry swab. Mm. So uh, uh, we cannot ensure the, the stability of the virus and the stability of the, the DNA. Uh, so the RNA of the virus, it's an RNA virus, very lapal. RNA is enzyme available everywhere. So uh, it might, this virus might be degraded and it might have a negative, uh, false negative result. So it's uh, usually it's rejected. Uh, such samples usually rejected. So, thank you, Dr. Sana. And uh, for the sake of the time, uh, I would like to thank all the presenters for their outstanding presentation related to the most of the hot topics we are living during this period, COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, we would like also to thank uh, Saudi Commission for Healthy Specialities for their uh, uh, unlimited support uh, to uh, conduct uh, such uh, uh, webinar and their unlimited support in virtual uh, continuous medical education activities. And uh, I would like to thank also all the participants today. And if, in case if there is any, un, any unanswered question during uh, either the presentation or some question need to be re-emphasized re with the speakers, we would like to uh, welcome all the audience and participant to send it to our email, the Saudi Society for Clinical Chemistry, and we will refer your question to target presenters. ندعو الله طبعا شكر لكم مقدم جميعا ندعو الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يزيل هذا الدعم قريب بإذن الله. شكرا جزيلا للجميع. شكر لكم الله شكرا على الدعوة. شكرا شكرا جزيلا شكرا العافية. شكرا.